Good morning. A very warm welcome to the elders, chiefs, members of parliament, honored members of the Senate, ladies and gentlemen. We have the privilege of being on unceded Algonquin territory this morning for a very special lecture. My name is Cindy Blackstock. I'm a member of the Gitsan First Nation, and I'm also very proud to be a member of the Board of Directors of the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences, where I serve as Director of Equity and Diversity Initiatives. I'm very pleased and honored this morning to welcome you to the Big Thinking Lecture uh, with Dr. Jim Miller. Uh, who has traveled here from Saskatchewan, and for those of you who may not be familiar with his very uh, prestigious background, uh, Professor Miller uh, was a professor of history at the University of Saskatchewan for 44 years, uh, a member of the Royal Society, uh, Canada Council Research Chair, uh, and he has just recently retired in June, but I think uh, from what I can gather, he's probably more busy now post-retirement than pre-retirement. Uh, because his area of interest is of vital importance to all of us. As the Truth and Reconciliation Commission continues its travels across the country, searching for answers about how we can build a Canada that is truly honoring of the relationship between First Nations and non-Aboriginal peoples and governments, Dr. Miller has dedicated his life's career of research into that area, of looking at the relationships between newcomers and Aboriginal peoples in this country. Today's lecture is also very special because it's part of a 20th anniversary series of the big lecture uh, series in Parliament Hill, where we are inviting back people who talked 20 years ago about these very issues. And I think we'll be, all be very interested to hear Dr. Miller's reflections. But for me, I think there's been a lot of progress and also some continuing challenges in this relationship between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people in the country. So we're uh, glad to welcome you all here this morning to what promises to be a very compelling and very country-changing lecture. And um, I wish to thank the Social Sciences and Humanities Council, Research Council, for the continued support of this series and their partnership with the Federation. So thank you very much to, to Shirk, and a very warm welcome, if you please, to Professor Jim Miller. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Bonjour. Thank you very much, Cindy, for the kind words of introduction, and thank you very much to the Federation, and also, as Cindy's reminded us, to SHRC, which funds most of the research that goes into presentations such as the one that I'm going to do this morning. As Cindy said, there has been a great deal of change in the past 18 or 20 years, but there's also been some continuity, and one of the elements of continuity is this idea that we never get along, particularly government and Aboriginal peoples have not got along. And very often people think that it's always been this way. The fact of the matter, of course, is that that's not true, and that there was a time in our history when we act, our relations were actually better. And that I'm suggesting that if we take a look back and to see when and how relations were better, and perhaps more important, how they deteriorated, perhaps we'll find some clues to how and why we might be able to change things for the better in future. It wasn't always true that we didn't get along. In the earliest period of our relationship, there was in fact a great deal of cooperation, particularly in the fur trade, in commerce, which is, along with fishing, one of the major reasons why Europeans first came to what the shores of what is now Canada. And what Europeans found was that in order to prosecute the fur trade successfully, they needed the cooperation, support, and the labor and skills and knowledge of the First Nations, who were, of course, the occupants of the territory and very familiar with the territory and its animals. A particular case that shows this so very clearly is the, the beaver, the beaver pelt, which was the prime skin that was desired in the 17th century because the 17th century was a period in which men's fashions dictated that you needed to have a broad-rimmed hat made of what was called fur felt. And the best fur felt was made from a beaver skin. But the beaver pelt had peculiarities. It consisted of two types of filaments or hairs, long, coarse guard hairs, and underneath it, short, 
downy barbed filaments, which, when pressed together, made this wonderful felt from which they make those wonderful hats that were much sought after in the 17th century. How do you get the best kind of pelt? The best pelt was what the French called castor gras d'hiver, literally greasy winter beaver skin. And what that referred to was the fact that you got the prime pelt when First Nations people made cloaks of it and wore them for a season or several seasons with the hair part into the body. The combination of heat, abrasion, and smoke over time would wear away the coarse guard hairs, leaving the soft downy filament that was perfect for making a fur felt. And that was Castor Gras de Ver. For their part, First Nations thought it was marvelous that these crazy Europeans wanted their cast off furs. So they had a very good complementary relationship. But that left a problem for the Europeans. And that was the problem of getting First Nations to cooperate with them. Their trade goods certainly were an incentive, but it required more than that because in First Nations societies, one could not just automatically, readily do business. One had to have a relationship with the other person in order to do business safely. You had to establish a relationship and, equally important, renew it regularly. And the way First Nations did that was by creating what anthropologists call fictive or ascribed kinship. They make people kinfolk. And how did they do that? They did it through ceremonies. Ceremonies that consisted of formal welcomes, gifts, exchange, feasting, and smoking the pipe. And what you find happening in the earliest years of interaction in the commerce first is that Europeans adapt to the First Nations way of doing things and be, allow themselves to be taken in to the enlarged circle of kinship. That is the foundation of the relationship for the first century and a half after contact. And not just in the, in the commerce, but also in the other early phase, which is the period of diplomatic and military relations. Here, too, you made kin of people in order to make allies of them. The reason that Europeans needed to do this was that by now, that is the late 17th century, France and England are beginning to contend for mastery of the eastern half of North America. And obviously, you want at least a friendly neutrality, or even better, the act of support of First Nations, the, the better to make your forces strong against your European rival. And again, the way you do that is through ceremony, through making kin. The other remarkable thing about this period of military and diplomatic relations and the creation of peace and friendship treaties is that most of them are recorded on the First Nations side in wampum belts, another marker of the fact that it is First Nations that are the dominant partner in these early interactions. The period of alliance and military cooperation goes on really till the end of the War of 1812. This picture supposedly denotes a meeting between Tecumseh, between Tecumseh and uh, General Brock, a meeting which quite likely never happened in fact, but it does symbolize the fact that the long period of relationship carries on right through the 18th century and into the early 19th century. And all that time, the process of renewing relationship through ceremony is going on regularly. When, count, when you meet in council, you get the use of the, family, the language of family. You address the other as my brother or my cousin, and you exchange gifts, you smoke the pipe, and so forth. That's the early period. That's when we got along. we got along because we needed each other. That very quickly falls apart, though, after the War of 1812, particularly after 1820 in, what, in Upper Canada, or what becomes Southern Ontario. Because after 1820, you get an inundation of heavy immigration from Great Britain. And these people are here not to trade, not to make allies for warfare, but rather to make farms. And they create, erect fences, they grow crops, and they interfere with the way of life, the hunting, gathering, fishing way of life of most of the First Nations of the Eastern region. And this is when things begin to go bad. 
This is when First Nations aren't perceived as a partner and an ally by the Europeans so much as an obstacle to doing what the European wants to do. The settler wants to make a farm and create towns. And now the First Nations become perceived as an obstacle and by the 1830s as well as an object of concern by humanitarian Christian groups. These events pave the way for the regime of tutelage, coercion, and attempted assimilation that is in place by the 1840s in Upper Canada. This is the beginning of the long period of our troubles. This slide is called Numbering the Indians, and it takes place at Wikwemakong on Mantuan Island. The agent is making, taking a census of the First Nations population. The social scientists in the crowd will know that if you wish to control people, one of the first things you do is you number them. So this is very much part of the attempt to control, to coerce, and to change First Nations. It is the leading edge of what becomes known as the policy of the Bible and the plow, a policy that will remain in place for over a century. The Bible portion of the policy of the Bible and plow is, of course, Christian missions, including education, but also including, very often, health care. The plow portion is converting or coercing First Nations away from their traditional ways of maintaining themselves and instead relying upon sedentary agriculture, the way Euro-Canadians maintain themselves. This is the policy of assimilation that will go on at least until the 1970s, if not longer. And when First Nations resist, often passively, just by not cooperating with the agents of change, the state, particularly after Confederation in 1867, and the creation of the Indian Department in 1880, Indian Affairs Department in 1880, will begin to apply more coercive tactics. This is when you get such things as the pass and permit system in Western Canada in particular, the attempted imposition of Euro-Canadian governance methods, elective chief and council rather than hereditary, and the attempt to impose that on First Nations, and perhaps in some ways the most destructive of all, attempts to change First Nations spiritual and cultural practices. Nothing embodies the new policy of the Bible and the plow better than the Indian Act. And the little bit of text from the Indian Act, it refers to the clause in the 1884-85 amendment which seeks to suppress the potlatch of the Northwest Coast. The Indian Act represents an attempt to create and impose a relationship that's totally at variance with the older relationship of kin-like peoples. This is a relationship of ward and trustee, parent and child, in, in, legally speaking. And it's a very much in contrast to the old relationship symbolized by the Treaty Medal, which was a relationship of partners in a kin-like relationship. For First Nations who had just made treaty, particularly in Western Canada between 1871 and 1877, to have the Indian Act imposed on them or attempts therefore to do that was bewildering and upsetting, as you can imagine. They thought they had just entered into agreements with the Queen's people that were kin-like. The treaties were sold by Crown negotiators in the language of family and kin. And then they find themselves subjected to the Indian Act passed in 1876. The policy of the Bible and plow will go on for over to roughly a century after this point, wreaking destruction everywhere. Perhaps its most notorious manifestation is, of course, the residential schools, which are, begin to be created in 1883 and gradually spread through most of the country by the period after World War I. And as is well known, these schools have left behind a great deal of damage. They were typified by poor facilities, the dormitory of the girls' school at Spanish Ontario, inadequate clothing, diet, medical care, supervision, 
and a host of other problems, not the least of which was ineffective and insufficient pedagogy. The education part of the school missions simply did not work. Most notoriously, of course, there was the problem of abuse. And attempts to change, to control and change people's minds. This slide perhaps is one of the most graphic examples of that attempt. This slide is a, portrays what is known as Lacombe's Ladder, named after Père Albert Lacombe, an oblate missionary in Alberta. What it is, is an attempt to teach catechism, Christian catechism, graphically. And you have to imagine that the two columns on the right actually go on top of the two columns on the left because this was on a folding piece of canvas that an itinerant missionary would take with him around to try to teach Christianity to people. And you'll notice there are parallel columns left and right. The column on the left is the way of good. The column on the right is the way of evil. And if you're particularly keen-eyed, you can see things such as the flood, Tower of Babel, the incarnation or birth of Christ, crucifixion, and so forth. Also, you can see the Protestant Reformation because you can see Pastor Martin Luther crossing over from the path of good. Father Luther passes over the path of good to become Pastor Luther on the, the evil path. If you go all the way through the path of good, you end up, of course, after death in purgatory and then united with God in heaven. But if you don't, you end up in the fiery place. What's the point? Well, the point was put to me very simply by a residential school survivor whom I interviewed in my book on residential schools. He said, you know, most of the people on that bad path, they weren't white. And if you look very carefully, you see that. And that's really what the course of denigrating kind of spiritual instruction that the residential schools represented tried to inflict on the children. Your ways are evil. The drum is your people talking to the devil. All those cultural and spiritual practices your people use are all bad. You must get rid of them. This, as you can imagine, was extremely unsetting, upsetting and disorienting to young people and very often had the effect of undermining the identity without replacing it by anything positive. And the final thing about residential schools as has become most notorious in the last decade or two is, of course, that was, they were the site of a great deal of emotional, physical, and sexual abuse. Recently, Canada has been beginning to work its way out of the residential schools, though dealing with the legacy, simultaneously working its way out of a period dominated the pol by the policy of the Bible and the cloud. That effort to face up to what the schools did and what the whole policy array did, in fact, the first step in that came in the 1980s when the churches that were actively involved in operating the residential schools began to apologize, beginning with the United Church in 1986 and then the Oblates in 1991, the, church of, the Anglican Church and the Presbyterian Church, and it culminates in 1998 with another apology from the United Church of Canada. They are the first of Canadians to face up to what the schools did. Unfortunately, that initial phase of facing up to things was followed by a really wrenching era of half a dozen or eight years in which individual litigation took place as people without any other recourse, survivors without any other way of dealing with it, had to go to court to try to bring the government to account for what it had done in creating and maintaining these schools. Eventually, by 2005, the government of Canada realized that fighting the cases one by one did not work. Once the number of cases reached about 12,000, they got the message. Some other solution is required. That led to the negotiation of what is known as the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement, which was finalized in 2006 and implemented beginning in 2007 after it had been approved by all the courts across the country. The settlement agreement has, as some of you will know, many components, an independent assessment process to deal with gross physical and sexual abuse, 
an adjudication process, common experience payments, commemoration projects, more money for the Aboriginal Healing Foundation, which existed then. And perhaps most important, but certainly continuing longer than most of them except the IAP, it created the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which has been working since 2008 to try to promote the cause of reconciliation and the education of Canadians in general to the residential schools and the harm they did. The other thing that has happened recently on the reconciliation file, although it's not that recent now, six years ago, was the prime ministerial apology that Stephen Harper made in the House of Commons in June of 2008. It was a very important step. Symbolically, it is still important. Unfortunately, it has not been followed up with meaningful action on a number of files that need attention. So that is where we have got to today. And if we ask ourselves, well, why don't we get along? Well, the answer is, well, we used to get along. We, get along, we got along when we knew each other and we related to each other, related to each other in ceremonies that respected First Nations ways and created a kind of kinship and partnership between people who needed each other for a variety of reasons. And that changed when the Euro-Canadian majority decided they didn't need First Nations anymore to achieve the objects which they had in mind, specifically the creation of a different kind of society and economy. And clearly, if that was the process that we've gone through, then the answer is then we have to try to get back to an earlier, healthier type of relationship. For one thing, it's the right thing to do. It's morally imperative to do it. Perhaps equally important, it is the practical, the, the materially important thing to do. Because nowadays, we do need each other again. If you're from British Columbia and you're thinking about a pipeline to the coast, you know about needing First Nations cooperation. If you're from northern Ontario and you're thinking about development in the Ring of Fire, you too know that you need the cooperation of First Nations in order to carry out the things that you want to do. If we can restore the kind of relationship that we had in the 17th and early 18th century, a relationship built on a kind of kinship or partnership based on mutual respect and mutual support, there is a prospect of once more being able to get along. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Miller. We have an opportunity uh, to have a question and answer period. Uh, we would ask for those of you who wish to ask questions to please use the microphones. You're welcome to use them, in, uh, ask your question in whatever official language you prefer. Uh, but please do identify yourself before you ask the question so that we can all have the benefit of the discussion. So with that, the floor is open. Um, <clears throat> my name is Ruel Amder, and my question uh, relates to the recent Supreme Court decision on uh, the, um, how shall I put it, uh, the inherent uh, native rights to uh, claiming land uh, without having to go through the treaty negotiation process. Uh, the case in British Columbia and now a similar claim is being made uh, in Quebec uh, and I'm wondering your thoughts on these. You're referring to the Chilcotin decision in yes. British Columbia? Yes. Well, I think it's just the culmination of a trend that's been developing with the Supreme Court of Canada and federal court since 1973 in the Collar decision, which first found that there was something in Canadian common law known as Aboriginal title. It simply recognizes that if you have not eliminated Aboriginal title by one of the two means that it's possible to do it, then it still exists. How do you eliminate Aboriginal title? Well, either you conquer the people that hold it, or you make an agreement with which, by which they either agree to give, up it, give it up or 
to share it, essentially. In Canada, our history shows that we have never conquered any First Nation militarily. So that option doesn't exist. So my answer really is that the Supreme Court is simply confirming a trend of interpretation that's been going on for quite some considerable length of time. It refined the definition of Aboriginal title and how you know that it exists and its extent. That's the big difference. It's not a an accident that it occurred in British Columbia because, of course, most of the province is not covered by treaties. Only Vancouver Island, the northeast corner with Treaty 8, and the Nisca Treaty, the late 20th century. We've had a BC TC or BC Treaty Commission process of negotiating treaties go on in British Columbia since 1992, over 20 years now, and we have only three agreements to show for all that time. One of the things we need to do is give the negotiators a better mandate so that they can come to agreements, especially now that First Nations in BC see in the Chilcotin decision that their Aboriginal title is even more robust in law than they thought it was before. She's coming, but she's uh, trapped by the tables, which is making her way. <laughs> Good morning, Professor Miller, and thank you very much for your talk. My name is Tanina Simeone. I'm with the Library of Parliament. You began your talk by asking the question, why don't we get along? And you answered that we did get along, and we had relations of kinship, and we knew each other. And I was wondering, when you say now that you know we do need each other again, particularly for resource development purposes, but I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on what prescriptions um, or what measures can be taken to go back to a more healthy um, relationship based on, on kinship that you mentioned earlier? I think the biggest obstacle to getting back to the kind of healthy relationship I was trying to describe is, that, is the distrust and suspicion on, among First Nation leadership that has developed because of the policy of the Bible and the plow and their mistreatment they received for a long, long period of time. I think in order to undo and to dissipate that climate, we need to build a succession of small achievements, small agreements, which over time will begin to create confidence rather than suspicion on the part of the First Nations leadership. I don't think big bang solutions that we try to solve everything at once are going to do it. We saw saw that fall apart with the First Nations Education Act to some degree, I think. So I think a succession of fairly small, targeted agreements that work, that begin to build confidence and dissipate distrust are the way we need to go, and that requires the leadership of the Government of Canada. It has constitutional responsibility under our, our Act, and that's the agent that has to do the job. Dr. Miller, I'm Jean Crowder, MP in Nanaimo Cowich in British Columbia. And I just want to follow up on Tanina's question because I, I, I think I absolutely agree with you. And I wonder if you got practical steps that policymakers and decision makers can take in terms of educating and informing themselves. Because in my experience, uh, decision makers and policymakers come to the table with uh, their own cultural framework in place. So they come with an attitude. That, that they're the dominant culture, and therefore they'll set the terms of reference, the framework for how this is going to go forward. And then they talk about engagement. So we need mechanisms to educate policymakers and decision makers to get them to change their own mindset, and I don't know if you've got any suggestions around that. Well, you won't be surprised that a university instructor agrees with you that education is a solution. <laughs> uh, we all have, tend to have that bias. I think the biggest, one of the biggest obstacles is the fact that Canadians at large have a misunderstanding of their history of relationship with Aboriginal people. We think, most of us, that our relationship is actually pretty good and we've done a good job. And how, we get that, that notion, that mistaken notion, I think, largely by contrasting our record with that of the United States. 
you know, which instead of making treaties in the 1870s, undertook Western Indian wars. Of course, we went on basically to starve Western First Nations in the 1880s, but that's the part of the story that doesn't get told nearly as often. So we have, Canadians at large, have a mistaken, rosy perception of our history. And academics, historians, and others have to bear some of the responsibility for not, dis not destroying that myth. We haven't done it, even though for over 30 years now, our revisionist history based on research has been developed amongst historians, anthropologists, political scientists, and lawyers. But we also work against the mass media, which has really absorbed, imbibed that mistaken notion. So we have to undo that settler mentality that we're good people, and so what are they complaining about? Essentially, I think that's, that's a big obstacle. And we need to get the word out that, no, our history is not as rosy, for the most part, as we tend to think it is, and we need to work on the relationship. Good morning. <coughs> My name is Dennis Bevington. MP for the Northwest Territories. You said one of the major problems is the distrust that Aboriginal people have through the process they've gone through. But my experience, and I've worked with many First Nations groups on, on environmental issues especially, is that there's intrinsically a problem in Canadian society in that we don't the values that First Nations people have are, are so linked to, to Mother Earth and to, to, to the land. And we have a society now that is almost completely hypocritical about the relationship that we have to the land. And that, that really, I think, is going to be the future um, problem that we have in, if we want to talk about how we relate to First Nations people is their values are actually, if you take a global sense, are more correct. And the values of Canadian society are failing when it comes to, when it comes to the environment, when it comes to the preservation of, of uh, and, and we can, you know, First Nations people don't simply look at that. They're, you know, they're, they're articulate and part of, of the global culture as well. So I think that is, when you future cast, about how our relationship is, that I think is going to be one of the problems that Canadian society has to face up to in order to, to reestablish a relationship. I agree. I, I think that the problem of contrasting values and worldviews is real and is simultaneously a challenge and an opportunity. It's a challenge for some of the reasons you outlined. But it's also an opportunity because this is an area in which non-Aboriginal Canadians can learn from First Nations and other Aboriginal people who have a different relationship to the natural world. Their views are what scholars of religion refer to as animism, the idea that everything is infused with life. And so you'll hear First Nations leaders, especially spiritual leaders, talk about my relatives, the rivers, my relatives, the trees, my relatives, the animals, for example. Everything is linked. Non-native Canadians can learn a healthier relationship to their natural world, which would lead, I think, to a more conservation-minded approach to living on this earth from Aboriginal people. From time to time, it does crop up that way, but it's, needs, more needs to be done in that regard and it certainly is an area in which we could learn from and cooperate with Aboriginal people. Good morning. My name is Catherine Fournier, and I work at the Department of Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development. And I'd like to say thank you for your uh, succinct yet comprehensive uh, presentation this morning, Professor Miller. And I would like to say that I certainly hope that nothing you said this morning is news to anyone in this room. 
or information that they didn't already know. And if that is the case, I hope it isn't, but if it is the case, I think that tells us a great deal about where some of the, some of the gaps are and from where a number of the problems uh, ensue. But the, the other observation I'd like to make is that I read an article recently that talked about how, although Canada's stated policy uh, was one of assimilation, that in fact what was carried out was an even more, you may say, sinister policy of segregation. And I think, uh, I think there's some truth in that. And I think that uh, while Canada may prefer, and many Canadians may prefer, to identify those policies as, as assimilationist policies, in some ways that puts, if I can put it this way, a more innocuous kind of lens onto the history that you've described there, that, that certain period. Because in fact, uh, there was much more in the policy of the establishment of reserves and the, the permits and passes and all that kind of stuff and that process of the, that relationship of, of uh, master and ward uh, that, that uh, show segregationalist uh, uh, objectives. And that may help us to really situate the full history of what's happened if we say uh, that, there, that despite the stated policy of assimilation, there was actually a policy of segregation. Because then that takes us to the other examples that we know of, of segregation. Uh, and perhaps then will help us to say, well, we need to understand, or it may help us to understand this history uh, if we look at where other segregationist policies have been put in place by uh, the dominant powers. And that may help us to get a better sense of why we are ended up here from there. Historically, certainly there are elements of a segregationist approach to policy. The reserves could be portrayed that way. Residential schools. And certainly that many of those things continue now into the 21st century. Underfunding of schools on reserves is one manifestation. Underfunding of child welfare policies would be another. But I think it's also important to understand that through no fault of their own, First Nations leaders came to regard those small areas of segregated territory, the reserves, in time as the only homeland in which they could and can practice their way of life the way they want to. And so they have become very attached to those reserves and fear any kind of policy, any kind of approach, for example, individual property ownership, that could be an entering wedge to destroy the reserve system. They didn't wish that on themselves, but that's where they are. So if the implication of your comments, which I agree with, at least to the points you made them, if the implication of your policy is that we should get rid of things like treaties and reserves, I think that would be highly destructive and merely exacerbate the bad relations we have. I'm happy to see you nodding your head no. Uh, bonjour. Mon nom est Denis Blanchet, je suis le député fédéral de Louis Hébert. Euh, J'ai écouté avec attention votre, votre exposé. Et à la fin, rapidement, votre conclusion, c'était qu'on devait revenir à un état précédent. Euh, là, j'ai un petit problème avec ça, je vais vous l'expliquer. C'est qu'à à ce moment-là, euh, à, chaque, à chaque étape de l'histoire... On a essayé de, on a eu des relations basées entre autres sur des relations qui étaient imposées par les nombres. Au début, euh, les Premières Nations étaient plus nombreuses, ils disposaient des meilleures ressources et ils ont imposé une façon de faire. Correct. Ensuite, il y a eu euh, le, le pouvoir des Européens et là on a vu une assimilation qui est en fait une guerre culturelle à proprement parler, et là, on est capable de décrire les effets néfastes euh, de ce qui s'est passé dans le passé. Maintenant, on est rendu à un moment où est-ce que euh, les nombres sont différents, les besoins sont différents. Euh, moi, j'aimerais plutôt qu'on regarde en avant. Et vous avez mentionné au départ, évidemment, qu'on devrait passer par l'éducation, mais 
comme j'aime beaucoup les, les sciences humaines, j'aimerais plutôt qu'on regarde comment, ensemble, on peut faire les choses différemment d'un point de vue culturel, de façon à ce que on puisse se parler, échanger et vivre ensemble dans une société qui sera meilleure. Qu Qu'est-ce qu que vous avez suggéré pour qu'on puisse développer, à travers les sciences humaines, les outils qui vont nous permettre d'avoir un meilleur environnement social et culturel entre nous? If I may, I'll just translate the question briefly. Uh, the, the MP from Louis Hébert uh, uh, challenged the notion that we can restore the uh, uh, past relationship, that the, 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 the historical uh, uh, numbers, it's, uh, that uh, First Nations were more numerous than, than settlers, it's, it's uh, totally reversed, and it's impossible to, to revert back to that relationship. So the challenge that's being expressed here is how, how, how can we uh, restore the kind of cultural relationship that, 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 uh, that on, on, on the equal basis, when the different, mm -hmm. it is a different context. So, so uh, in, instead of looking back to what was a good moment in our relationship, looking forward, how do we can restore a, a more equal relationship? Is that mm -hmm. a, a fair capture? Thank you. I think the great equalizer that to some extent overcomes the disparity of numbers is the constitutional status that Aboriginal people have since 19, have had since 1982, Section 35. This is a great equalizer. This gives them a basis to defend Aboriginal and treaty rights and to build on Aboriginal treaty rights. In terms of how do we begin to work forward to overcome the past difficulties, I mentioned trying to build on a series of small incremental victories, positive ag agreements is one thing. Education, as was suggested by someone else, would be an important part of that. It will be a long, hard struggle. It will not be simple. But there are encouraging signs along the way. The constituency of Louis Hébert, the province of Quebec, the government of Quebec not that long ago signed Pays des Braves, for example, an agreement with First Nations in Quebec, which tried to signal a desire for a better relationship between the government of that province and the First Nations there. So I think there are signs of movement towards reconciliation and reestablishing better relationships. That is not to underestimate the difficulty of the challenge facing governments and other people that want to bring that about. Art Eggleton, uh, Senate of Canada. Uh, one of the issues we hear a lot about these days is uh, the clash between native self-government and the accountability measures that the government of Canada extracts and expects in the traditional way that it, it operates. Um, we uh, also hear, of course, about uh, cases where there are allegations of abuse of that money and perhaps some great reality to some of those. And perhaps that, what that seems to be doing is poisoning the atmosphere in terms of the many native communities that are doing a, a very good job of, uh, of how they expend that money. But how do, how do we overcome this kind of perception and reality, as, as it may be in some cases, to, uh, to, to be able to combine that accountability factor with uh, native self-government? I think you're right, Senator, that um, greater than any accountability issue is a perception issue. The number of cases that we hear about of misuse of public funds is, can easily be balanced by a number of cases of reserves and leadership that are enormously successful. In my province, we've had chiefs prosecuted. We also have a leader like Darcy Bear of the Dakota Moose Woods Reserve one of the most successful, dynamic, positive reserves and leadership anywhere in the country. In my province, more MLAs and their staff have gone to jail or at least been convicted for malfeasance with public funds 
in the 1980s than First Nations leaders have, for example. I think to a great extent it is a perception problem. The media have focused on a relatively small number of instances of malfeasance, and that is what the public pays attention to. Hi, my name is Jason Unruh. I'm a journalist, freelance journalist. Um, thanks very much for your presentation this morning, and um, it's a bit of a challenge to try and fit 300 years of uh, the relationship into a uh, half hour. Um, my first thought is that uh, for further reading, uh, the American Revolution is a good place to start, really, for the embryonic, uh, you know, relationship between uh, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal in Canada today. Uh, my question uh, is, uh, it starts with uh, Ms. Blackstock's introduction. And um, I've heard this a few times before. Heard it at Ottawa U, heard it at uh, the Idle No More protests. This idea that uh, parliaments on unseated uh, Aboriginal land. Now, <clears throat> we can debate this another time, but my question to you basically is, how are we going to solve the bigger structural problems, the education problems, the health problems, uh, the, the larger societal issues, if we cannot even agree on a basic land tenure for where our government house sits? I think the way we go about dealing with that issue is adjudicate the claim. You know, the, the claim of the, the Algonquin to this territory has been lodged. It's necessary to have it processed and, and adjudicated. If you settle that, then you can move on to other things. There is a huge number of unresolved claims, both comprehensive claims, that is Aboriginal title claims, and specific claims, claims based on a notion that some lawful obligation has not been discharged, usually a violation of a treaty term or an Indian Act clause. If we could make better progress in resolving those claims, and I'm, I'm not saying necessarily accede to all of them, I'm saying to get them adjudicated fairly and fully then I think we could also dissipate a bit of that climate of distrust that I suggested was an obstacle to progress in future. Hi, Dr. Miller. It's Jody Broom. I'm with Strategist Consulting. I just had a sort of two-part question. It seemed to me that part of the, uh, the, the, the message of the question was asked in French. It seemed like quite a profound question, too. It was, it was almost like, to date, it seems like everybody... One side or the other has had a trump. So at the beginning, it was the numbers, and the First Nation, there were more, and then later, there were Canadians and settlers, and there were more of them. Now you say there's the constitutional trump card. I guess what I understood the question, and what my question would be, too, is how do we get past the, you know, work together or else something really bad will happen, violence or protests or, you know, constitutional gridlock? My second question to you was, it seems as a result of these two decisions that just happened with the Supreme Court, that there's actually a pretty profound role also for the provincial crown to step up and to be involved in trading. And, uh, you know, 9124 is one thing, but Section 35 is something that has to be adhered to and, and has to be respected by both provincial and federal crown. I wanted to know what you saw to be the role of the provinces and going forward as well. On the question of numbers and, and uh, things that trump other things, my suggestion was not that Section 35 trumps the disparity of numbers, but rather that it's a counterweight that tends to even things up quite a bit, that's all. On the question of the role of the provincial crowns and the provinces, that is extremely important. If we're talking about Aboriginal title claims as they're trying to resolve in British Columbia through the BCTC treaty process, the provinces definitely have a role because they have jurisdiction over crown lands and natural resources. And if any settlement includes making more territory available to the First Nations claimant, then they have to have a role. The same is often true of specific claims 
in my province and any province that has a regime of treaties, if there is a claim that land was taken fraudulently, as was the case in Saskatchewan in the early 20th century, and you're going to make restitution with create, adding more territory to reserves, then similarly the provinces have to be involved. It's been extremely difficult to get the provinces to step up in these areas. I know that, again, just referring to my home province, there is a treaty commission, and there the province sits only as an observer. In practice, though, it has stepped up in terms of supporting things like teaching treaties in the classroom, an ambitious educational or curriculum program that it makes the importance of treaties in our history very, very clear. They've also stepped up in other ways. Part of the reasons that provinces have been reluctant to step up and play the role that we need them to play is that for a long time the federal government was always trying to foist responsibility on them, trying to shuck responsibility that you described under Section 9124 onto the provinces. For example, welfare in the 1990s. Federal government in the early 1990s took the position, well, if First Nations people move from reserve to town and need social assistance, that's a provincial responsibility. They took a very restricted interpretation of their responsibility. So we're, we have a bit of a tit-for-tat argument going on between the two senior levels of government. Somehow, I don't know how, we need to get beyond that <clears throat> and get a more cooperative regime in federal provincial aid. I know that's terribly, terribly naive, but that is what we need nonetheless. With that, Dr. Miller, sure. unfortunately our time is up. Um, but I do want to thank you very, very much for contributing to our conversation of reconciliation as a country and as peoples of diverse and distinct uh, realities. So please join me in issuing a very warm welcome to Dr. Miller and inviting him up. We've got a small token of appreciation for you, Dr. Miller. We'd also like to thank again our partner Shirk for your continued support of the Big Thinking series and for your continuing support of scholarship in the social sciences and humanities. Um, also is a uh, member of Parliament James Rochette here. We just want to acknowledge you, uh, member, for uh, hosting this event and making it possible for us to host it in the Parliamentary Library. So very, my, very deepest thanks to you and to your staff. And thank you all for joining us here today, for taking time out of your schedules to devote a bit more time and reflection to this important Canadian problem and important Canadian opportunity of restoring the relationship between First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples to one that we can all feel proud of. Our next event in a Big Thinking series will be on October 9th, so please mark that in your calendar, where we'll feature uh, Guy Laforest, the Professor of Political Science at the Université de Laval, and Guy, Guy will be speaking to us about Quebec's place in Canada. Please note that this next lecture will be in French, and uh, more information is available in the flyers that you've received on your registration table, or of course, you're welcome to go to our website. With that, I wish you a very good morning and a very a big thanks for uh, joining us here today.